have held me in your arms, in my head. I've been witness to your charms a thousand times. You have sung me a love song in my head. Welcome to the fourth episode of the Attic Sessions. Um, you're very welcome, though it's not our attic this time round. We've gone on the road to Belfast and brought the attic to the home of poet and playwright Maria McManus. Um, and we're going to be chatting with her and with poet Stephen Connolly about the current buzz around writing in, in Northern Ireland. So thank you very much for hosting us, Maria. It's, oh, you're welcome. it's a joy to be here. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for both of you. Um, and it, it certainly seems from, from our perspective down south that there is an incredible flowering of new voices in, in Northern Ireland over the past decade or so. Um, the Rising Generation, which Poetry Ireland uh, recently published, has quite a lot of uh, poets from here. Uh, Stephen, I know you've recently co-edited a new anthology of Ulster poetry um, alongside Sinead Morrissey. So is this a phenomenon? Phenomenon? I can't even say the word. Is this a new thing? Or um, am I just the latest lazy southerner jumping to conclusions and making generalizations? I suppose, okay, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say you're the latest la <laughs> lazy southerner. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that for a minute. I think that the scene here is very vibrant. I think there are m many people writing. I think one of the big influences in making that visible uh, is social networking. It's been happening. Um, and I think the biggest shift for me has been um, post ceasefire, you know, in terms of what, what I have seen. So I could put it back that far. But, but I suppose for anybody who was involved in the scene up here before that, they would maybe have a, a different view mm, mm -hmm. but I think but certainly the, the impact of social media is significant we're more connected mm -hmm. it's easier to be in touch with with the people who are uh, working in the field in in the south and further away than that you mm -hmm. know across Europe and across the globe really mm -hmm. um, so I think I think there's something about the the visibility of it Mm. It has changed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Stephen, I think? guess um, I have never really known anything else than the last uh, than the last decade. Um, I guess ten years ago I was seventeen, yeah. Yeah. and I just started um, just started going to to things in in bookfinders on University Road. Before I knew before I knew very much, uh, you know, really about about poetry from Northern Ireland, um, kind of at all. You know, it's I'd gone to school in North Belfast, and uh, one of the offices in the school was uh, the house where Louis McNeice was born. And I thought, you know, Louis McNeice, Irish poet, must be terribly boring. Um, it was before I'd before I'd read McNeice, of course. Yeah. Um, but I guess I just I haven't known I haven't known much different. But I think that what you're saying there about um, about the internet and about social media um, that. People of around my age um, have grown up, uh, grown up with the internet, um, kind of at, at, at about the same time. Um, so we don't know, you know, what it would be like, for example, reading Paul Muldoon or Maven Gookian without being able to track down uh, what's going on in some of the poems. Yeah. So I think that there's perhaps an awareness of what's gone before um, that's even a heightened awareness. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine reading Paul Muldoon and having to go to an encyclopedia every time. You know, I, do that. I, don't, have, so, I don't have so that. So Google and the availability of, of that kind of internet search has just made that type of poetry a lot more accessible. Absolutely. Well. I, th I mean, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that makes a lot of sense. I should, by the way, say Ziggy <laughs> uh, is the third <laughs> guest at this interview. And he'd heard about Baxter in the attic in Dublin, so is, is sort of keen to get involved. And we're going to ask him a question maybe later about what he thinks about poetry. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think he should respond with a lot of heavy breathing. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. Good fair enough. Good Does, um, d d so would there be um, anything around the fact, you know, that the, the Queen's master's programme in, in, in the Seamus Heaney Centre 
I think both of you have, have gone there. Um, do you think that that's had a, a role in terms of just sort of developing a whole poetic generation? I, th I think without, without a doubt, it, it, you know, Queen's Heaney himself, you know, amongst m many of the, the, po the poets who come out of the North are like lightning rods, yeah. in a way, you know, um, in terms of creating a hub. Um, but I think there's something more than that o also, um, y you know, because there, there is there is a lyricism in the storytelling and the vernacular language, mm -hmm. the everyday up here, mm -hmm. um, that's very rich, and I, I, perhaps across the, the totality of the island of Ireland. But I know that for me, and I don't think for a minute that it's the, it's the only way for people to write poetry or it's the only way for it to be validated, but I know that it was important for me in terms of an, a means and a mechanism to structure my own learning, mm -hmm. to carve out and protect time mm -hmm. in what was otherwise a very busy life, you know, to just kind of dedicate time and space and be around people in a, in a formal learning environment. That was, that was important for me. Mm -hmm. And I guess in, in Stephen, in your, your case, it was a more um, natural progression from undergraduate to postgraduate, but it was that particular type of, of postgrad that you opted for. Yeah, um, I didn't know that it existed until I think it was halfway through um, an English degree. Yeah. And um, I'd, I think I'd been uh, quite gung-ho in, in my approach to all of it. Um, so, so when I was an undergrad, um, Michael Longley was the professor of poetry, um, and if I didn't know anything about Louis McMace, I certainly didn't know anything about Michael Longley. Um, but I knew that you could book appointments to go and uh, visit the, the 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 professor of poetry, the chair of poetry. Um, so I sent an email saying, "Dear Michael, uh, I am an undergraduate who writes poetry. Um, would you?" Uh, you know, would would I be able to come and, and and talk to you about some of it? So I sent him a poem. Uh, I sent him a poem uh, called "The Walk," and um, it was at a time that I was obsessed with T. S. Eliot, and um, I thought I was. I don't, I don't know what I, I don't know what I was up to, um, but it was a really terrible poem that was um, alluding to to. Um, to metaphysical poets and, and taking lines from here and there, and it was utterly terrible. Um, but when I went to see Michael, and uh, he read this poem, and uh, he said, uh, I can tell that you're a young man who can write, but when I read this, I don't hear Stephen Connolly's voice coming through. And I went, and, well, I don't want to, you know, I'm into, I'm, yeah. into, uh, <laughs> I'm into this modern stuff that's nearly 100 years old. Um, but, it, you know, th there was kind of a, there was a welcoming atmosphere, yeah. I thought, that, um, that I don't really, you know, I, I don't really know anything other than that kind of yeah. inclusive um, atmosphere. Vona Grark, uh, I met her in, in Cork recently, and she said, what is, what's going on up there? Um, she's been editing the the, the, the last uh, few issues of poetry. Is there something in the water at the moment? Yeah, or what she is said, it? Uh, you know, what is it they're doing up there? And my, you know, in, I have in, in what way though? You know, I mean, for what? I think in the last few issues of the last few issues of Poetry Ireland Review, about a quarter of them mm. yeah. have been taken up mm. by. Mm. Kind of so it was in in respect of people. You know, the producing people like, work um, and submitting. Emma Must and Padraig Regan, mm. Stephen Sexton. Mm. Um, in Scott Jemison, mm. James Patterson, there, there, there mm. seem to be a lot of people um, mm. who, uh, who have been coming through the, the Heaney Centre. I've got yeah. a theory that it's just that Sinead Morrissey teaches, mm. um, uh, teaches people how lines work, yeah. how, you know, how, how poems work, and then um, Karen Carson comes along and <laughs> throws the dictionary at people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's, I don't know, there's, there's some... But I also had a theory that that there are little shibboleths and you know 
um, but that's part of uh, that's part of every you know mm. every interaction mm. that you have with mm. anyone else, mm. and that hasn't you know that post ceasefire that hasn't gone away. I don't think. No, no, Do you no. Know no. What I mean? I, but I, I suppose the the other thing that I see happening is you have people who are out there in the field, uh, Myra Donaldson, Ruth Carr, mm. uh, Kate Newman, Joan Newman, who for years have been drumming away, doing a lot of work in communities and with writers groups. And yeah. they're not the only ones, you know, yeah. that, that, that there's, there is something about the discourse up here, you know, and maybe it's just about the kind of friction or the sandpaper or the dilemmas also that, that people have experienced. That means we have to find a way to express this. We have to find a way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. People are, and and one of the forums wherein difficult things can be explored, and joyful things can be expressed. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, there's there's a rich there's a richer place yeah. in literature for the human experience here. Well, I wanted to ask you again, you because you you mentioned specifically people like Ruth. Carr, who, yeah. who was sort of writing as Ruth Hooley before, mm -hmm. and Joan Newman, and Jean Bleakney, mm -hmm. and Laura yep. Donaldson, and, and um, I had read an article by Alex Price about the apparent invisibility of a whole generation of women poets in, in Northern Ireland, and, and I remember that like when I first came here in 95 and went to Poets House when Jimmy Simmons was running it in, in uh, Port Muck, that the names that were being associated with, with Ulster Poetry himself, Longley, Heaney, Montague, Mahan, um, Ormsby, and, and that was kind of it. And you, you weren't really told about or aware that there were women of the same generation. Maeve Begukian got a mention, but she was probably the only person who really was. And, and, and then, I, you know, reading the Alex Price article, it, it seemed to sort of reinforce that notion that women were writing, but they weren't being collected, they weren't being anthologized. Um, and I, I'm assuming, and I know that that has changed, but, but, you know, and I also know, this is a very long question, but I also know that it was the kind of thing that Yvonne Boland was talking about in, in her object lessons, how she came out of a generation where she wasn't aware of female role models. But, but Maria, for you're, you're my age. Were you sort of conscious as you began writing that if you wanted to find women role models, you wouldn't find them in book published form or, or in the anthologies? Was that something you were aware of coming out of that? Um, I, I suppose there's the, the, that's certainly true. They weren't as obvious in those written forms but I tell you without a shadow of a doubt they were the people who were working on the ground out in the field nurturing p other voices including people um, generating a lot of the work um, with with communities and and with new writing and doing a lot of the footwork on encouraging mm -hmm. um, is my experience um, and there can be something of a, an atmosphere sometimes of things being combative or, you know, that discourse in the North, and I mean in its broadest sense, has this, it's like, like a bear pit, you know, that everything is treated like a competition rather than a choir. Mm. You know, mm. or um, like an argument rather than exploratory discourse. And in a way, I kind of think that there is a model then that, that was much more obvious back then that actually the things that validated people were publication and these things. And, th and there were power structures behind that. And there's, you know, a deep power structures in society that gave more of the men more access to those things more of the time, mm -hmm. and they looked out for each other more of the time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but my experience is the w the women were there, you know. But we've seen, you know, I mean, 
the, you just see that pattern mm. replicated again and again in many di different things. Mm. So, you know, look at the whole Waking the Feminists yes. movement ar around what, what happened this year around the centenary uh, commemorations, and for the example. And the lack of female writers in, on the Representation. Yeah. But they're there, yeah. you know, so yeah. I kind of think um, there's something there's something in, in that dynamic. Yeah. But has that changed from your perspective, Stephen? Like, is that something that this generation would simply not recognise because nobody is... I mean, that, the, the essay by Alex Price, I think, is, is fantastic. And, you know, to, to, you know, to my shame, I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd realised uh, just kind of how scandalous uh, those in particular, sorry, Frank, but those two... Um, Two anthologies, where in the first, you know, the first poets from the north of Ireland, it was just, it was a, it was all men. Yeah. Um, and in the nineteen ninety uh, edition, it was. Uh, Were there four? You know, <laughs> no, there was Maeve, Maeve McGuckin, it was Maeve. and okay. and that and that was it. Yeah. Um, I guess you know, but since I've started reading, started writing, um, the, the, you know, I guess one of the first, uh, one of the first books, of contemporary poetry that I really fell in love with was Leontia Flynn's These Days. Um, you know, an, anybody in their in their, their, their late teens or early 20s, I, you know, I couldn't recommend that book highly enough. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the people that I've looked up to, um, you know, the, the, the people whose work I read, the people whose, uh, you know, whose opinions and things I respect highly, mm. uh, are the likes of Sinead Morris mm. and Leontia Flynn. So, it, it doesn't seem. I mean, there's always <laughs> there's always work to be done. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that perhaps, um, if you know, that perhaps men are wising up a bit. Mm. You know. Mm. Mm. But no, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much. I don't think so. I think I think um, a lot of people are very opportunistic about what they can get for themselves, and I think they. You know, there is a dynamic sometimes whereby people will enable other other people from the power base that they have. I think those are very simple group dynamics in mm. a way. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I suppose if there was a thing that I envy about men sometimes, in, in and I'm generalising, is that they're very single-minded and very focused on themselves. <laughs> So, you know, women could maybe do with developing a little more healthy narcissism. Yeah. Healthy narcissism. Yeah. And men could do with a shed load less. Right. <laughs> narcissism. You know? And and more generosity, more inclusiveness, more um, interest and more curiosity about, about, about what is happening at the margins. Because mm. my mm. view of it is, it's there. You, but it's about where your eye falls, yeah. where your ear falls, and what's happening in the spaces in between, you mm. know, where, mm. where people, the less looked at mm. places. I mean, and, you know, there will undoubtedly be conversations to be had around where the, we, we were calling them the, the new Irish in 2005, 2006, like, you know, everybody who'd come here to work and stayed and their kids go to school and you know the proportion of those who were writing and and wanting to publish and see their work and where are they and uh you know it's it's like any other struggles uh for visibility um i mean there's that um there's a recent essay in um in a a, a major literary journal um that was it was the editor had given himself twenty pages to um, to write about uh, about the, the xenophobic attitude that that makes up Irish poetry with a capital I and a capital P, um, and you you know you look at then the the contents page of that particular you know that yeah. particular issue of that journal, and out of twenty seven contributors, there are two women, three yeah. women, yeah, and I think you're right that. <laughs> uh, that, that um, I don't know. That men can men just are so 
so bloody ignorant. I suppose it's, it's the, the mote in the eye and stuff. You, you, and as we said, have just uh, co-edited a new anthology, um, and it's Blackstaff mm -hmm. Press, and also called, called New Poets from the North of Ireland. So I'm guessing partially you had in your head the title of the Absol absolutely. Inf infamous um, 1990s. Um, so how, how, how did you make your choices with Sinead about who would be included and what were you looking for and what were the criteria? And, um, and it's there, I know you have it beside you. I've got it here. People in the camera it's, um, want to see. Yeah, we... Um, it's a lovely looking production. When we were approached, the, 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 the kind of... Um, the thrust of it was going to be, um, I think that, that, that Blackstaff wanted the book to feature um, a lot of poets who had um, perhaps started publishing um, in and around the year 2000. But Sinead was convinced, um, and she convinced me very, very quickly that there was a book to be, um, a, a book to be put together uh, that was um, kind of more, more recent. Um, and we we decided um, we decided that it would be um, poets generally who had started publishing in the last in the last decade, um, and we didn't want to be essentialist about it. So we had you know if you were born in in Northern Ireland, it was sort of automatic eligibility, um, or if you had um, if you'd lived in Northern Ireland for at least three years. Yeah. So a third of the, you know, I think a third of the contributors to the book um, were born elsewhere, which I think is, um, is is quite a. I mean, hopefully it's it, it's um, healthy proportion. It, yeah, it's yeah. Um, you know, well, but hopefully it's it's in some way representative yeah. of a wider, you know, a wider change in um, it, it, in Northern Irish society, um, because it's. But that's one thing that uh, one thing that I worried about a little bit, um, and the, the title itself it, it was most definitely a, most definitely a reference to to the the Ormsby edited mm. anthology um, anthologies. And what um, is the breakdown of male female just out of interest? It's um, ever so ever so slightly. Uh, to, I think there's one more man in it than mm. than than women. Mm. Um, so it's it, 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 it's 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 getting there, perhaps. Oh well, no, um, absolutely. No, but the, the 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 screaming gap gap in it all, all of these things, I think, is still that generation of older women. Yeah. You yeah. know. Yeah. Ignored by the Ormsby collections mm -hmm. by their and contemporaries and, and, all and that. Yeah. Not, yeah. not and, captured and, subsequently. And they're and they're still there. Yeah. You know. Um and the you know the women who went out and. And nourished a whole generation of voices as well, you know. So it's not, and that's not mm. in any way, kind of a, a, a put down of this because I think any of these books have got to have a criteria and uh, an inclusion. But I just think there there is something else. Yeah. There, so a sort of a retrospective you know, as well yeah. as the 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 new yeah. voices. Yeah. Uh, time for some publisher to take on a sort of a retrospective. Absol role. Absolutely. Yeah. That would yeah. be. Um, Incredible book. Can I ask a bit about both your your own work uh, and, and and what you're on, on working on at the moment? Because I know um, <laughs> Maria, you 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 combine playwriting as well as yeah. poetry. Uh, I think Paul and me and it does similar things. Um, do you use different parts of your brain? Do you think when you're writing both, is there a sort of a okay? I'm in a poetry frame of mind. I'm in a storytelling playwright. I'm in a dog, dog training. Dog training. training <laughs> dead of mind. Mind. Sit. <laughs> um, I think whichever I am uh, doing, I have to bring full attention to it. In some respects, in so, in in some respects. They are, they just come from the same energy source, but the but whatever it is has to be written, has to find its own form, mm, mm -hmm. and but and most of what I write will will come out in in poems rather than in the, in the plays. But when I do the plays, I suppose it's a lot more intentionality around doing 
um, background, historical yeah. research, those kind of things. The most recent piece I'd been doing was a piece about Elizabeth Corr, who was a part of the Easter Rising. And oh, okay. It was someone who lived on this road, on the Ormer Road in Belfast. Mm. And that was to contribute to, to the commemorations of 1916 and one element of it. So it was important to get the historical details right and then to kind of really um, sink I into that. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, it takes something different and I need to be with it um, very uh, fully and do a lot of reading around supplementary um, people and to contemporary, uh, contemporaneous mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of uh, perspectives in, into, into view. The poetry, in a way, is a lot more free. Um, I'm not trying to address those issues and none of that stuff is ever written right. as a commission. Yeah. Or, no, yeah. I wish. <laughs> but you are, because you were telling me earlier, there is a particular project that you're working on now in the yeah. poetry front that involves collaboration yes. as well. Do you which, is, which is, which is a, a real uh, pleasure for me. So the project itself is called Cirque des Oiseaux, which is the, the circus of birds or the hawk of the birds. The overarching theme is on auguries and auspices, you know, the very ancient art of interpreting the will of the gods from watching the flight patterns of birds. So basically I'm generating a text that I hope will be a third collection at some point in the future. The working title being Even Carrion Crows Sing Love Songs. And, uh, so, Lovely. Um, and then there are a number of visual artists, Rosie McGurran, who is formerly from the Ormer Road but lives in Connemara, Ari Newleman from Dublin, um, Helen Sharp, who's based in Fermanagh but from the Outer Hebrides originally, and Bernard Lynn, who's from County Antrim, um, Dr S Simon, uh, oh, I've, sorry, Simon. Who, who's uh, based at Queen's and is a uh, composer, and Tom Hughes, who collaborated with me before on the cello suites. Mm -hmm. um, so but we're doing soundscapes, visual art, installation type stuff, and I'm generating the text to which people are responding. So it's kind of nice to be um, experimenting with a sustained theme and finding other mechanisms to push poetry into public space and into public consciousness as well as collaborating with other artists. Mm -hmm. So yeah. did you bring something from that that maybe you could read for us? Because yeah. it would be lovely I to will, hear something. I will do. Very good. So do you, would you like me to do I that I would love now? to hear it now. Um, so if I just read the, the first um, poem, it's a bit of a long one though, is, is that okay? That's absolutely grand. Remnant Nomenclature. First Starlings in dark ballet, bold scrim across the blue hour at Albert Bridge, and the day yielding into something altogether more sultry, unknown. You said, like iron filings and a lodestone. Suddenly, liminal, here, now, hovering between Catalina blue heavens and back then, a memory measured in luminosity, Adolescence, school skirts hitched and rolled at the waistband, bare-legged, absorbed, conducting experiments in polarities and magnetism. In Italy, they say the ravens and the crows speak Latin. So the answer in that case to any big dilemma, say, for example, should I stay, should I go, when it's worth the opinions of a congress of corvids and for times when what you need more than anything is the perspective only a bird's eye view delivers with due consideration and without unkindness the answer will be the answer will always be cross cross tomorrow tomorrow and the stars of the sky fell to the earth they are earthed now a rabble of shawlies mocking each other, grubbing amongst the windfalls, plucky 
on stout pinkish legs. They have no better sense than to announce themselves, draw the wrong attention. A hawk can't be tamed. It's wild and it's fierce. It's not bothered about anybody. Starling's law falls, the hawk a hitman, and there it is, Argo Navis among the the Bramleys, a feathery galaxy pluming downwind across the orchard's floor, the stilling of one heart, quickening the other. Though its prey was pinioned supine, the hawk at times lost balance, a billy bunter on a wobble board, watching its back, looking to see who might be looking. The starling made a feisty racket in the ambush. It showed up with gutsy martyrdom, fought the fight of somebody with nothing left to lose, all screeching maw, stabbing, nipping, spearing the hawk's heart. Its tarsals clutched hard, grounding the marauder by the anklet, screaming all the while to be let go, though it held on fast, as if its own life depended on it. We all do that sooner or later. Hold on tight, stay and keep ourselves in the line of fire when going would be life itself, however uncertain. It is better then to make a friend of death, to let it come, to give in, than suffer the small deaths, weak, callous love. Be soft, offer no resistance, become something all the more elemental, give in. Pain is temporal, and then it's over. Reset the compass. Salvage tail feathers and wings. Leave all other bones, the body, the carcass, the unseeing eyes. Make of yourself a stern, a seal, a hull. Drop a plumb line. Avoid dry land. Fantastic. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Um, so Stephen, what I mean, have you had time to work on your own stuff <laughs> over the last round? What um, what's coming from you? I haven't had much time in the last in the last six months. Um, yeah, in the last well, this this book has kind of. Uh, I'm not. I, I, I'd, no, I, I I couldn't really say I'm sick of the sight of it. No, I'm still um, kind of excited every time I every time I see it. But I haven't had much time to to be doing too much. Yeah. Um, would you be working towards a collection, or? or? I think that um, I think at the minute I, I'm trying. I mean, I'm also trying to finish a PhD, at the minute, and that's some fun. Um, when is that due to be submitted? I, I'll say it now that it's supposed to be uh, handed in, handed in in September. Oh um, well, it should be it should be graduating at Christmas, but fantastic. Yeah, let's let's hope it all goes to plan. Um, but no, I've been um, I've been kind of reading as much. Um, as much about the history of Belfast as I can find, um, and it seems that it, it seems that there there are alternative. I guess there there are as many alternative histories um, as there are days of the week or you know days of the year. Um, but I I think that possibly um, I think a lot of people writing now might be doing similar similar things. Um, I'm trying to find. Other ways to approach the past, um, where there's, you know, I guess so much has been so much has been written mm. about the last 30, 40, 30, 40 years um, that there, I guess there, I, there are ways to look a hundred years into the past that mm. uh, that that provide, um, I don't know, some some sort of a different way into um, a, a different way to look at. at a contemporary society mm. that isn't necessarily, you know, that doesn't necessarily have a, a big um, shadow of the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, well, you're, um, I guess, of a generation for which that was history. You know, you 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 didn't live through it. Yeah. So it's it's history. I mean, it, I I grew up thinking that um, that soldiers were on the streets uh, to make sure that all the boys and girls had their seatbelts on. Um, I mean, my my my, my parents. Um, I guess they grew up in the almost in. My dad t- lived almost in the centre of town, um, and I, I can't imagine. I just I can't imagine what life must have been mm. like for them. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, 
there's still the, the fallout of mm. it. Um, so your um, your poetry goes back further. Possibly, um, possibly. I don't. I, I, I haven't. I haven't written in anything very much in the last in the last few months. Did you bring in along anything too? Yeah, you? I've got. Um, you know, I've got a, a couple of poems in this book. Right. Sinead said, uh, now if you're doing this, you have to be in the book. And I said, no, I don't want to be in the book. She said, you have to be in the book. Said, Fair enough. Well, okay. It's okay if the co-editor take, uh, says it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't have too much, uh, yeah, I didn't um, put up too much of a fight. Um, okay, here's a, here's a poem um, called Another Exchange. Um, yeah, it's called Another Exchange. The heavy door was open. I was a sinner, a simple country person, the least of all believers. But something of his boyish face was easing from the off. His boyish face that flickered in relief against the wall. His boyish hands sleek as polished glass. And music played allegro as the moon made its slow advance through the skylight across the floor, where as instructed I placed a turnip at his feet, whereupon his sleek boyish hands and quick boyish tongue were moved to act his voice becoming my voice, his hands becoming my hands, as he carved from the turnip my father the deacon's face. He told me what I had to hear, and I was quick to mention war, whereupon his boyish eyes receded far beyond the night. I was about sixteen at the time. Which, a lot of that's taken from, um, I guess, the most famous translation of, of St. Patrick's Confession. So that goes mm. back a few years. It certainly does. It certainly does. So what are the dreams, aspirations, ambitions for both of you? We're, we're, we're sort of at the closing stage of the interview. So, so what would happen to make you think, yes, I've nailed it? <laughs> I just, I have such a nice life these days. I I have everything. It's enough. I'm touching wood for you, Maria. It's enough. It's a wonderful thing to be able to say. It's enough. Mm. It's enough. And just to be able to keep doing, you know, to to kind of beat my own best is enough. Mm. And see what happens, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm with you there. Yeah. I think it must be an armor rule thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be nothing, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, I think I'm yeah. see. I work in a lovely bookshop. Um, no alibis, best yeah, yeah, bookshop yeah. in Belfast. Um, so as long as, you know, as long as uh, I've got enough money at the end of the day for a few books and, um, and, and for food on the table. I, but yeah, I don't, um, I don't know. I think if, if I ever felt that I'd nailed whatever it might be, um, I'd just turn complacent. Yeah. L- life is a bigger thing, you know. I kind of think if I, if I live my life the writing will look after itself and uh, you know and and yeah focus on more better along the way and and see what opportunities arise from that and Mm -hmm. and that's all good Mm -hmm. but um i don't know i kind of feel like i've had to shed several skins in in recent years and uh and that was hard going Mm. but i kind of I, I understand much more that it's about a, a life well lived. And the process. And Ziggy would now say that it's about going for a walk in Ormo Park, and that's. Yeah, and really now it's raining. <laughs> oh, Ziggy. So you're going to have to wait. Apologies for that. We kept, we kept Maria too long. No. Listen, thank you both very much for oh, coming to this attic. Um, it's been wonderful to be here and to talk to you both about poetry life up here um and thank you very much for watching we'll be back again next month um subject matter to be revealed and uh, in the meantime thanks for watching the attic sessions yes i know that i'm just a dreamer i dream because it's the closest i'll ever get to you